Marcel tightened the last cords on his hiking backpack. He stepped back admiring how neatly he packed the bag. Every year, he and a group of friends went on three-day expeditions into the mountains, and this year he couldn't wait. The fresh air, the peaceful sunrises, and the morning dew always evoked a sense of calm in Marcel. It was his temporary escape from reality, the never-ending lectures and nerve-wracking exams. That's it. Marcel muttered after throwing the knapsack on his back. Early the next morning, Marcel and the rest of the expedition met at the main train station in Prague. Mako, you still haven't bought a new backpack. Your back will thank you, Julie teased. Am I the last one? Marcel ignored Julie's question. Julie, Chenda, Anaita, and Marcel had known each other since high school. All of them were now college students, but the tradition of the annual trip had endured. This year, the group was heading to the Eagle Mountains, first by train, but from Van Perk only on foot. Next time, you'll be pulling the tarps? Shenda grumbled gruffly when the group arrived at the shelter, where they planned to spend the night. Shenda doesn't talk much, but when it comes to complaining, he never shuts up, as Julia would say. Sometimes Marcel wondered why he even went on the hikes with them every year and kept annoying the whole group with his sullen remarks. They found themselves at a clapboard arrangement, where travelers normally merely take a break and carry on with their march. The sun was slowly sinking behind the horizon. Annetta and Marseille were just setting up the tarps under the shelter when they heard Julie's startled scream. What are you yelling about? Shenda says. Julie stood there, flabbergasted. We, oui, I think I saw someone over there. She stammered, raising her index finger toward the deep woods. Anita rolled her eyes. She collapsed onto the tarp and looked at the screen of her cell phone. Maybe it was a leprechaun, Shenda remarked, laughing at his joke. There's no signal. Anita sighed, tucking her phone into her backpack and slipping into her sleeping bag. Come on, let's go to sleep. Anne has already kicked the sack, Marcel said. Julie was still staring between the spruces as if expecting something to emerge from the darkness at any moment. Nightmares had been bothering Marcel for a long time. That's why he never slept much. On top of that, it was chilly and the fog was spreading around the makeshift campsite. He stretched and awkwardly dug himself out of the sleeping bag. Julie's sleeping bag was empty and the rest of the expedition was still asleep. He pulled a bread roll out of the backpack, spread melted cheese on it, and sat down on a bench under the shelter. Chenda woke up a few minutes later and sat down next to Marco. Where's Julie? Chenda asked absently. She must have gone to the bathroom? I don't know, Marcel threw up his hands. When Anita got up, the group grew nervous. Hey, come on, try to call her. Chenda urged Anita. How am I supposed to do that if there's no signal, genius? They waited another hour. Julie was still missing. Maybe we should go to the police, Annetta finally suggested. But neither of the boys had a better idea, so they packed up the campsite and headed back toward town. The omnipresent fog shrouded the landscape so that they could barely see a step. Everyone was silent. They pondered what could have happened to Julie, and scenarios of varying levels of believability formed in their heads. Shit. Shenda broke the silence as he tripped over a wooden bench. I don't believe it. Aneda breathed. They found themselves at the wooden structure the group had used as a shelter from the elements last night. Geez, we're back where we came from. Marcel said out loud what everyone had figured out by then. We'll never get to the police station like this. Let's make a line and search the woods around here. Aneda decided. They took off their backpacks, kept on their flashlights, and set off into the depths of the forest a little after dark. Julie woke up. Her head was pounding. She could see twinkles in front of her eyes and wanted to vomit. She found herself lying on the floor in a dim hall. Only a single torch was installed on the concrete wall, giving Julie a sense of where she was. A cellar, the dampness, and rats in the corner of the room told her. Tears welled up in her eyes. She felt a need to scream, but the rag in her mouth prevented it. She tried standing up, but the ropes on her legs and arms wouldn't let her. This is just a nightmare. Nothing more, Julie tried to convince herself. Panic clouded her thinking. Her heart was pumping fast and loud. Julie screamed through the gag, trying desperately to cry for help. But her howling was soon cut off by a voice, a voice barely audible, unnatural, whose almost childlike tone sent shivers down her spine. I'm going to make you beautiful. A figure appeared before Julie. It was of average height with messy brown greasy hair, a gray hoodie and jeans. A white porcelain mask adorned with pouty red lips and red painted cheeks gave the man or woman a disturbing impression. The person's eyes could not be seen. Julie tried in vain to make out the pupils, but all she saw was endless darkness. It watched Julie admiring her like a work of art. While the girl struggled desperately with the ropes, it took a pair of scissors from a small tool table, snipped idly in the air a couple of times, and began to cut Julie's hair. The girl cried and screamed. She tried to resist, but soon her scalp was naked. 
I pulled a small tube out of their jeans pocket. It spattered lipstick inexpertly across Julie's lips and cheeks so that the girl's face resembled the porcelain mask the mysterious kidnapper wore. Suddenly the creature turned sharply as if it had heard something. From its crouch, it stood on both feet and walked away. Meanwhile, the trio has started falling into despair. There's no point in this, uh, Chenda said resignedly. They had been combing the forest all night and still no sign of Julie. Is that, is that a church? Aneta asked rhetorically when she saw the ruin of what had once been a place of worship in the middle of the forest. A white plastered structure rose majestically through the trees, creating a sharp contrast with the ubiquitous timber encircling the building like a royal guard protects their monarch. Something felt off. Eerie, Aneta, Chenda, and Marcel silently approached the moldy wooden door. Let's check it out, shall we? Marcel didn't even wait for an answer and walked right in. Their flashlights revealed a crimson moth-eaten carpet, occasionally accompanied by amber pews alongside. A golden altar at the end of the rug dominated the room, a church like any other. They all thought until they took a good look at the huge paintings that adorned the walls of the nave. Remember the paintings? My grandmother used to take me to church services, Anita explained, but they certainly didn't have these masks on them. As soon as Anita finished speaking, both boys realized what was special about the paintings. All the saints had their faces covered with white porcelain masks. Hearing human voices from afar, Julie screamed as loud as the gag in her mouth would allow. She let out a wild guttural wail, hoping that her desperate cries for help would be heard by someone, anyone. Do you hear that? Marcel asked the others, not expecting an answer. Immediately, he ran to the rusty metal hatch he noticed in the corner of the room. He opened it. Stone steps appeared before his eyes. He didn't hesitate a second and climbed inside. Anita looked at Chenda uncertainly. He merely shrugged his shoulders, and so she followed Marcel. Chenda had already stepped one foot inside when he noticed move. He turned slowly and directly behind him there. Whoa. I make you beautiful. Marcel jumped off the last step and thoroughly scanned the dungeon with his flashlight. The room was empty, musty, and full of rodents running from the light. In the corner of the cellar, he discovered a kind of workbench and next to it, Julie, Marcel asked uncertainly. The bald woman in ropes with a grotesque mechilage on her face only answered by shouting unintelligibly into the rag stuck in her mouth. Marcel and Anita slowly freed Julie from the ropes. We must get away before he before it comes back. Julie blurted out as soon as Marcel untied the piece of cloth. Where did Chenda go? Anita realized. Shit, Marseille muttered and rushed up the stairs. It was too late. Chenda's dead body lay on the floor. His eyes stared absently at the ground, lying limp on the tiled floor, scissors embedded between his shoulder blades. Marcel yelled. It's not true. Water welled up in his eyes. He wanted to scream, to curse. The girls burst into tears, desperate tears in utter shock. They knew there was no escape. They would find nothing but damnation in this godforsaken bizarre place. The trio sobbed over their deceased friend until Anita noticed a figure standing at the entrance. I'll make you all beautiful. The masked stranger expelled in its disgusting, almost childlike tone of voice. Anita, Julie, and Marcel panicked, instinctively rushing to the windows on the other side of the church, terror in their eyes. Marcel jumped through the broken window, followed by Julie and a son of a lean for Anadeta cursed after she vaulted over the windowsill. She tried to stand up, but instead she hissed like trapped prey. I think I broke my leg. Anita sobbed. The creature with the porcelain mask approached the window. Marcel and Julie looked at each other. They didn't have to say a word. They both knew it was too late. They made their escape. Where are you going? Help me, please, please help me. Anetta choked in her desperation. Marcel and Julie ignored the cries that echoed throughout the woods and kept running until the screaming abruptly ceased. Marcel and Julie sprinted as fast as they could. They pushed their way through the never-ending thick fog, occasionally interrupted by skinny trees. They stopped at a clearing. The trees were no longer growing and instead, a wide plain spread out in front of the pair. Both Julie and Marcel stopped in disgusted amazement. This? This is hell? Marcel whispered. The clearing was filled with crosses as far as mortal eyes could see, large wooden crosses, and on them bodies. Each of them naked, hairless, each lifeless crucified corpse had its face painted red across its lips and cheeks. What D Y? Marcel stammered without taking his eyes off the gruesome scene for a second. He was in such a trance that he didn't even notice the white porcelain mask slowly stalking up on him from behind. Led by pure instinct, Julie grabbed a large rock she found on the ground and threw it with all her strength. The creature slumped to the ground, cautiously. She approached the mysterious kidnapper. She examined him, the masked killer who had murdered two of her friends only moments before. 
He lay there motionless as if all the strength had drained from him. Curiosity overcame Julie and she removed the outlandish mask. Beneath it, she found a reasonably average face, a man in his early 30s. She sensed an inviting warmth when she picked up the mask in her hand, arousing an uncanny desire. She put on the mask, all of a sudden Julie understood. All the pieces of the puzzle connected and she finally knew it made sense to her. She realized what beauty is. What kind of pig can do something so horrible? Marcel asked, still oblivious to his surroundings, shivering in raw horror. Julie walked over to him. She stood by his side, silent for a moment. Can't you see how beautiful they are? I'll make you beautiful too. In this chilling tale, we meet an elderly woman who at first glance appears harmless, yet she's on a quest to satisfy a hunger, but her tastes are far from ordinary. There's too much choice. I can't possibly decide. People hurry past me. All sorts of people of different heights and skin tones and shapes and faces. Every single one of them seems to be in a rush. And they all seem to know where they're going. The Lapri has latent style. I am a statue in the center of chaos planted to a bench in the middle of the shopping center, as immovable as a boulder in the wind. I haven't been to a place like this in a very long time. They thought I wouldn't be able to handle it, you see. But I am managing perfectly well with it all, no matter what they might get you to believe. They told me not to come here. I'm never allowed to go anywhere with too many people, you see, they don't trust me. So I thought it would be jolly funny to prove them all wrong and show them just how wonderfully I could cope. I would do my shopping and I would behave perfectly respectfully. No funny business, not like last time. And here I am, sans funny business in this delightful social hub where people are shopping for their loved ones, where they are meeting for lunch and where shop assistants are checking their watches to see when their shift ends. It was all terribly exciting. Watching people shop and live their lives, I had wandered round the stores, noting all the glitzy, expensive items in a dignified, unobtrusive way. And it was only until I saw a large, sweaty man clutching a pretzel walk past me and the smell wafted its way to my nostrils that I found myself considering my lunch. Rashinks I had promised to resist, but what could it hurt? And so I took myself to the busiest part of the whole shopping center, the food court. The food court is a maze. It's something that I would have drawn 40 years ago when I imagined the future, with huge glass panels above our heads and loud music and smells of every kind attacking our noses without an invitation to do so. I mean, the smells, so many of them. I hadn't expected anything like it. Chips and pizza and garlic and fish and burgers and spices and hot dogs and popcorn. My senses were dazzled. They were battered into submission until that the aromas began to merge together and became indistinguishable from one another in one united foodie odor. I saw meat sizzling on grills, saw the pink raw burgers darken until they were fit to eat. I saw chips hauled into fryers to be oiled alive, gently glistening as people crammed them into their mouths. I saw more popcorn than I ever thought possible whirling around inside a huge machine until it was time to be chosen. I saw raw fishy. They call it apparently being diced up and transformed into seamless shapes and exotic colors. It was all unspeakably vulgar seeing so much food all at once, but the crowds were gobbling it up. And every restaurant was full of greasy, writhing bodies, chomping away on flesh and oil and salt. But I was not tempted. I was too dazzled. I felt accosted by choice. I left after a minute seeking respite, though rest of the shopping center seems bland in comparison. There are few smells here save the secondary stench of the food court which sticks to people's clothes. Even the plants, plastic of course, bear no smell. Nothing lives in here. I wonder if the food smells have stuck to me and give my jumper a cursory sniff. But I only smell washing powder and lavender soap. I probably smell like an old person. When I was younger, I used to hate the smell of old people. They smelt like death and flowers and talc. Now I am one older than everybody around me, so old you might not believe me if I gave you the number and I find my own personal aroma rather comforting. I have decided to content myself with watching the people pass by me. It might stir my appetite into motion. A woman rushes by with two children. She snaps at one of them. Her arms are laden with shopping bags and I wonder what might be inside. Toys, perhaps. But she has a face like a melted Wellington and I decide she is not the type to be generous. With her children at Christmas, poor things, she snaps at the youngest again for dawdling and he retorts back with a profanity, lifting his middle finger up to add flourish to his response. I shift my allegiance to her, the little bugger. When I was a girl, I wouldn't have dreamed of speaking to my mother that way. I wonder if I might follow them, but for now I am content to just watch quietly. It would be too obvious anyhow there are not enough people here. And I see people carrying paper cups of coffee and tea and hot chocolate. 
and others sitting on benches similar to mine eating their lunch. A boy takes an enormous bite of a Big Mac and coughs, choking on it. My stomach growls tentatively. His father distractedly offers him a liter of Diet Coke to wash it down with. And at the sight of him slurping on the brown liquid, I feel the growling inside me turn to revulsion. I am stealing myself to go back there and face the food court again, but it seems ever so difficult. This is where I'm sure to find the best pick for my lunch, but my body feels like it's been attacked by odors and sounds. My hands feel sticky from where I had the misfortune to put them on a railing, and my feet are worn and battered from wandering round and round the restaurants on a lurid, nightmarish carousel. Spurred on by the incessant growl of my stomach, growing stronger now, I decide to make my way back and face it head on. I merge through deflated crowds, navigating myself through the families and the couples and the single people. And eventually, I am back. I am back among the smells and the sights and the sounds, the shimmering cafes and the glitzy restaurants. A free shadang. I look around me, breathing in the appetizing aromas that wave tasks, wondering how I will make my choice. I have not been out in such a long time. It is so difficult. How do I know what's best? Do I make my choice based on appearance or scent? What if, after all this deliberation, I choose badly? I feel the familiar sense of panic swell inside me and wonder if they were right after all. Perhaps I can't be trusted on my own. Perhaps I have grown too old to be discreet. Perhaps I should just go now before anything goes wrong. But the sight of a plump, middle-aged man sitting in the window of a popular Italian chain makes me stop. He is devouring his food. Gooey cheese oozes over his pizza. Pasta is slurped up into his eager mouth. I feel a stirring. I have made my choice. I go over to the restaurant where the hostess greets me with a wealth of menus. Normal gluten-free vegan, I falter, unsure of my response. I'll just start with the tap water, I say, asking to be seated near the window. I seat myself next to the lone diner, weighing up his features. His cheeks are wonderfully rosy, his arms are round and solid. Yes, he will do nicely. Are you sure you don't want a menu, madame? The waitress asks as she brings me my water. Not just yet, I say wondering how long I can stall her. To her, I am just an innocent old lady. She is sure to indulge me a while longer. I have made my choice and he will do nicely. They said I couldn't do it discreetly, but I remember what to do. It's been so long since I've had a proper meal. Saliva dances on my tongue. I just need to work out how I can get him alone. Excuse me, I say. He looks up. Would you be able to walk me back to my group? When you finished your meal, if it wouldn't be too much trouble? I met on a day trip with my care center and I've managed to lose everyone. He smiles gently. I'm just a harmless old biddy. His face is kind, trusting, full of blood. Yes, I will certainly not go hungry tonight. There wasn't much about 2015 that didn't completely suck. My marriage was falling to pieces. My spouse had grown cold and indifferent. Our son hadn't been diagnosed with autism yet. He was still a toddler, but we knew there was something off about him. We knew something was wrong. By summer, I moved my belongings into the guest quarters, and that became my bedroom. It was the beginning of the end with the two of us in bitter denial or possibly waiting for the other to end it first. A 5.0 a.m. alarm got me up for work every weekday morning, and I spent most wakeful moments trying to find a way out of dump truck driving and construction. My spouse was less than supportive. I didn't have the funds for college. I was too busy to learn a new trade or skill. I once in a while I'd come up with a cool sketch or painting. Sometimes I'd write a poem that people appreciated, but I didn't have the talent or skill to replace the earnings of my day job. So every weekday, it was a 10 to 12 hour shift of double clutching a tandem axle Mac. I'd haul a flatbed trailer with heavy equipment for a paving crew to get the mortgage and bills paid. The second Friday of June didn't seem any different from any other weekday. It was payday, I planned on spending time with my little one, putting him to bed, and getting into a cheap bottle of whiskey before passing out in the guest room. For the time being, I was still on the clock and getting ready for my last run. My foreman Mike asked me as a special favor to take an overloaded flatbed a few miles down the road. Normally I would have said no, but I liked Mike, I didn't want to argue, I just wanted to wrap up the day and start my weekend. My worst case scenario I thought was an overload fine from a dot officer. The crew loaded a paver, a skid steer and a roller onto a flight bed trailer designed to hold two thirds of the combined weight of all that equipment. Everything was already chained down. I told the guys I'd see them in the yard after I hooked up to the trailer. I eased off the clutch and into first gear. I could feel the Mack truck struggle to pull the overloaded flatbed trailer. 
I got it to my first traffic light without demolishing the dump truck. Stopped ahead of me only because I began to downshift and brake well ahead of time. I realized my seatbelt was off and tried to put it on, but it wouldn't budge. The light turned green, the sky opened up, and a torrential downpour pissed all over everything in sight. Last started driving, but kept the rig 10 miles per hour. Below the posted speed limit convinced that would keep me safe. I passed a quarry on my left and began my descent down a steep grade on the way to my stop. They got part of the way down the ominous hill and traffic was stopped ahead in the distance. I gently applied the brakes, but the truck tires started skidding on the wet road. The trailer began to jackknife over the double yellow lines into oncoming motorists. I eased off the brakes, regained control of the trailer, and reapplied them. The same thing happened. All the while, I'm still moving towards stop traffic going 30 miles an hour downhill with a combined vehicle weight easily exceeding 60,000 pounds. The old country road had one lane headed downhill. One lane headed uphill, no shoulders and nothing but trees on either side. As a last ditch effort, I pulled the parking brake and started stabbing at the brake pedal. Crashing a commercial truck is almost always fatal for the driver. Not having a working seatbelt wasn't really helping my odds. The cars stopped ahead were now less than two tractor trailer lengths away, and I couldn't stop the truck. I thought about my wife. I remembered being in love with her before we started hating each other. I thought about my son. I thought about the people stopped ahead and their families. I thought about how much it was going to suck dying in a dump truck from colliding into the trees on the side of the road. A collision was inevitable and there was no way in hell. I was going to allow innocent motorists to get killed. My last run had turned into a suicide mission. Being a non-religious heathen, I thought per chance there may be something close by. Some ghost that watches over truckers and bikers some spirit perhaps inhabiting those woods. I called out to it, make it quick. That was my first and final pair to whatever sprite inhabits that forest. Where I didn't see any way possible I'd survive what I'd do next. And I didn't want to linger in agony following the crash. I just wanted my death to be swift. I turned the steering wheel away from the traffic and into the woods. As soon as my front wheels left the pavement, the bumpy wooded terrain shook me violently, throwing me into a world of hurt like I'd never known. As an at-risk teen, I'd been jumped, hit with chains and bats. I'd been beaten mercilessly by my bastard of a father as a child. Nothing I'd experienced could have prepared me for the beating the inside of that truck put on every inch of my body. The trailer snapped off and headed into another portion of the woods. The truck roared into the forest with me as its hostage, mowing down vegetation, leaving hunks of metal all about as the tree branches of the forest fought back against this hostel. Diesel powered invasion. Ripped the wheel for dear life while smacking all about the console. The control panel, the shifter, and feeling every abrasive texture grind away at my flesh. The truck hit a big bump that sent me head first into the ceiling. Blood went everywhere then, it hit a dip and skidded to a violent stop. A terrible pressure pushed into my chest. I thought I was having a heart attack. Somehow, I didn't go flying through the glass as the horrifying ordeal came to an abrupt halt. As quickly as the crash ended, so did that awful blow to my chest. As I had sighted the smoldering wreck that was once a sturdy Mack truck, I was covered in blood It had what seemed like a sheet of plastic, a grocery bag, perhaps, stuck to my head, It wasn't a grocery bag hanging off my head. I didn't realize at the moment that my scalp had been partially degloved. It peeled right off my noggin. My skull exposed and blood pouring all over me. It was hanging off the side of my head, I imagine, much like a peel hanging off the side of a piece of fruit. It must have happened when I hit the ceiling of the truck's interior. What hurt more than anything at the moment was my chest. It couldn't have been the steering wheel. It wasn't a heart attack. I didn't know what it was that kung fu'd the ever-living shit out of my sternum. I was just glad I was still alive. Only moments later, I was getting put into a sea collar, strapped to a backboard and loaded into an ambulance by paramedics. My Blitz t-shirt. My favorite punk rock shirt was blood soaked and sheared off me by the medics. They took my vitals and asked questions meant to gauge my level of consciousness. Then for a moment or two, they fell silent. Am I gonna make it? I joked as I turned my head to see both medics staring at my sternum, mouth agape and eyes bugged out in bewilderment. After a second, they assured me everything would be fine and continued with routine measures during medical transport. That about the day's events at the hospital. I got all doped up by the docs, got my scapled and bandaged, and got admitted to my room. I thought about my terrible judgment, the last minute decision, the dying man's prayer and the blow to the chest while crashing and somehow not flying through the windshield. I thought about it all in my hospital room. I stood bare-chested before a mirror gazing at my bruise. Across my chest, spanning about 12 inches in length, was a deep purple mark in the shape of a giant, ghastly hand. 
The digital camera is a scary ghost story about a little girl whose mother dies suddenly. She begins to exhibit strange behavior and refuses to be left alone. It is based on a supposedly true story that apparently happened in Japan a few years ago. One of my relatives passed away suddenly. I never met the woman. She had a daughter who was four years old. The little girl's name was Yuki. Her father wasn't able to raise her on his own, so he asked my aunt to take care of her. The little girl refused to be left alone and never left my aunt's side. It started to become a problem. My aunt couldn't go anywhere without Yuki. She constantly needed attention. Even my aunt's own daughter started to get jealous. One day, my aunt told me she had to go out of town for a couple of days and asked if I would babysit the little girl for her. I said it would be my pleasure. I lived alone and I could do with some company. A few days later, my aunt dropped Yuki off at my apartment. As she was leaving, she took the little girl aside and said, Yuki, please be good. Behave yourself. When my aunt was gone, I tried to talk to Yuki and play some games with her. But the little girl's behavior was very strange. She had a teddy bear tucked tightly under her arm and never let go of it. She never smiled. She never spoke. All she ever did was sit quietly in the corner and stare at the wall. It made me kind of uneasy. I was trying to find something that would entertain her. I had just bought a new digital camera and I decided to let Yuki play with my old one. When she saw the camera, her eyes lit up. I showed her how to use it and she went around my apartment taking pictures of everything. There was a bright smile on her face. That evening, I discovered how difficult Yuki was to deal with. Whenever I tried to leave the room, she started crying and screaming out my name. I couldn't leave her alone or she would create a huge fuss. She even insisted on going to the bathroom with me, which was very embarrassing. Zeta's devil tea was at bedtime. She refused to stay in the spare room and insisted on sleeping in my bed. I read her a bedtime story and after a while, I managed to get her to go to sleep. That was when I noticed her teddy bear. One of its legs was charred and blackened as if it had been burned. It made me wonder. In the middle of the night, I was awoken by a strange noise. When I turned over, I saw that there was something wrong with Yuki. The little girl's body was trembling and shaking. Her eyes were wide open. Her teeth were chattering and tears were streaming down her cheeks. I held her close and asked her what was wrong. She's looking at me again, she mumbled. Who is? I asked in surprise. The dark woman replied, Yuki. She wouldn't say anything more. I tried to tell her it was just her imagination, but she kept shaking her head and whimpering. It took me a long time to get her to go back to sleep. The next day, Yuki was fine again. She loved playing with my digital camera. When it was time for her to go home, I told her she could keep it. Yuki hugged me. Although she didn't say anything, I could tell she was overjoyed. I dropped the little girl off at my aunt's house and stayed to have a cup of tea. My aunt thanked me for taking care of Yuki. We spent a while chatting at the kitchen table. Poor little thing, said my aunt. She hasn't said a word since her mother died. I couldn't contain my curiosity. How did Yuki's mom die? I asked. A strange look came over my aunt's face. She died in a fire. How did the fire start? I asked. Well, my aunt hesitated, unwilling to talk about it. It's a very sad story. She committed suicide. Yuki's mother was a very troubled woman. She poured gasoline over herself and lit a match. She burned herself alive. Mom, I exclaimed, how horrible. Yes, said my aunt. Her family was so shocked. They hushed it up and pretended it was an accident. I, we had a small funeral, but only close relatives were invited. Yuki wasn't there. She doesn't even know her mother is dead. She thinks her mother is just on a long holiday. We haven't had the heart to tell her the truth. Poor Yuki, I murmured. My aunt nodded her head sadly. Poor Yuki. A few days after that, Yuki died. My aunt was trying to change Yuki's behavior. At night, she forced the little girl to sleep in her own bedroom. Even though Yuki screamed and cried, my aunt left her there alone and locked the door. In the morning, she found Yuki lying motionless in bed. The poor little girl was dead. Nobody could understand what had happened. The coroner couldn't determine a cause of death. There wasn't a mark on her body. She was perfectly healthy. She had just mysteriously died during the night. There was no explanation. The, after the funeral, I went back to my aunt's house. Everyone was very sad. She returned the digital camera I had given to Yuki. I took it home with me. It was something to remember her by. The memory card was full of random photos that Yuki had taken. I browsed through them, wiping a tear from my eye. There were pictures of my apartment, pictures of my aunt's house, pictures of flowers, dogs, toys, candy, silly pictures that a child would take. Then I came to the last picture and it made my blood run cold. My hands were trembling. I wanted to scream, but nothing would come out. The timestamp on the photo showed that it had been taken on the night Yuki died. Here's the last picture that poor little girl ever took with my digital camera.
creepy things kids say to their parents. And an internet forum posed a question. What is the creepiest thing your child has ever said to you? The responses were scary, spooky, disturbing, and chilling. My three-year-old son was cuddling with his grandmother. He took her face in his hands and stared straight into her eyes and said, you're very old and you will die soon. Then he made a point of looking at the clock. A friend of mine's child told him, Daddy, I love you so much that I want to cut your head off and carry it around so I can see your face whenever I want. My three-year-old daughter was standing over her newborn baby brother, looking at him. Then she turned to me and said, Daddy, it's a monster. We should bury it. My cousin used to freak him mom out as a child. Whenever her mom would ask her why she did something mean or wrong, she would whisper, the devil told me to do it. I was babysitting for a little girl, and she asked where I had parked my car. I pointed out the window to my car across the street. She looked at me and said, go to it without looking both ways. I asked her why, and she replied, I want to see someone die. One night, I was tucking in my four-year-old son. He said, goodbye, dad. I corrected him. No, we say goodnight, he replied. I know, but this time it's goodbye. I had to come back and check on him a few times during the night to make sure he was still there. My little girl went through a phase where she would just constantly say I too thing. Hi, 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 hi one day, it sounds sounded strange. So I asked her, what's that you're saying? She turned to face me and just whispered, die, 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 die. My niece was sleeping over at my parents' house one night. She had all the lights on in the spare bedroom. I asked her if she was afraid of the dark and she said, no, I am afraid of what is in the dark my five-year-old daughter said, Mommy, when you die, I want to put you in a glass jar so I can keep you and see you forever. My six-year-old son laughed and replied, That's stupid! Where are you going to find a jar that big? My three-year-old daughter was holding her newborn baby brother for the first time. She looked up at me and asked innocently, so I shouldn't throw him in the fire? My sister was pregnant and we were having a conversation at the dining room table. My four-year-old son asked my sister if there was a baby in her belly. She told him there was. He slid out of his chair and headed for the kitchen saying, we need to get it out. I'll go get the knife. When my son was little, I would sometimes hold him down and pretend to eat his face, saying nom nom no. One day he said, I'll never eat your face, mommy. I'll cut it off and wear it as a mask. My five-year-old cousin drew a picture of a hideous black monster. Then she looked up at me and said, he told me to draw this. He's coming for you. You better hide. When I was about three years old, our cat had kittens, but they all died. I asked my father if we could make crosses for them, which he did. As he was making them, I asked, aren't those too small? Dad, what do you mean? Me, aren't we going to nail them to them? A several moments silence. Dad, we're not gonna do that. My mom loves to tell this story. Apparently when I was five or six, I told her that aliens had stolen her real son and replaced him with me, an exact copy. I said that someday I would return to my home planet, but she shouldn't be sad because her real son was having a good life in our zoo. My little cousin was thrown out of a Catholic preschool because he took off his shoe and told one of the nuns, shut up or I'll take out your eye with my shoe because I'm the son of the devil. Apparently that was the last straw. A cow was awoken from a deep sleep at around 6 a.m. My four-year-old daughter was standing over me and her face was inches from mine. She looked right into my eyes and whispered, I want to peel all your skin off. For a few seconds, I was terrified. In my sleep addled state, I didn't know if I was dreaming or what was going on. Then I realized what she was talking about. I had been sunburned the previous week and my skin was starting to peel. My niece was sitting on the couch with a weird look on her face. I asked her what she was thinking about and she said, I'm imagining the waves of blood rushing over me. As it turns out, they had just come back from a local science museum. There was an exhibit on the circulatory system of blood in the human body. My three-year-old son was telling me there was a man in his room. Mommy, he said, the man has big yellow eyes and he is looking at you. I tried to tell him there was no man and my son just told me, oh, he is hiding now. Two minutes later, he said, oh no, mommy, you made him very mad. Now he says he will come when you are sleeping. Sometime later, he told me I'm not going to be four. I'm doing to die and you will put me down, down, down in the hole. I assured him that wasn't true and asked who had told him that. He got very quiet and replied, the man told me, but I will be scared. So after three nights, you will die too and come with me. Vi was in the basement of my friend's house with her two-year-old son. He took my hand, led me over to a brick chimney that had a rusty metal door on it and said, that's where the dead babies go. I, mean, I was looking at houses with my brother and his three-year-old son. 
As we passed the school, the little boy said, if you buy a house here, that's where your kids will go to school. Then we passed a pool and the little boy said, and that's where your kids will go to the pool. Then we passed a cemetery and he said, and that's where you'll bury your kids. One night when my daughter was four, I overheard her talking in her room. I poked my head in and asked if she was talking to me. No, she replied. I was talking to the little boy who lives in my closet. He's dead. But I jokingly asked my little cousin, what's the best way to get a girlfriend? His response was tell her to be my girlfriend or she'll never see her parents again. One day, totally out of the blue, my five-year-old son said before I was born here, I had a sister, right? Her and my other mom are so old now. They were okay when the car was on fire, but I sure wasn't. One day, my three-year-old son hugged my wife and said, very seriously, mom, I promise I won't ever chew on your bones. My five-year-old daughter had night terrors and she would sometimes scream in her sleep. One night I said, mommy's here, it's okay. She looked right at me and screamed, mommy, but who is that behind you? A few months ago, my three-year-old daughter was playing outside in our backyard. My wife was sitting on the back step and my daughter came up and asked her if she could play with the little girl on our slide. My wife said, I don't see any little girl. And my daughter said, she's right over there on the slide, mom. Can't I play with her? My wife said, I don't see anyone, but my daughter kept insisting. She's on the slide and she is blue. Can I play with her? My wife was freaked out, said, let's just go inside and get a snack. For the rest of the day, my daughter kept looking out the back door, telling my wife that the little blue girl was lonely. When my brother was very young, he was sleepwalking. My mom was trying to get him to go back to bed. He said, I would, but the devil is behind you. One day, my four-year-old son said, my brain is telling me to do things I don't want to do. I just hope his brain wasn't telling him. Burn them, burn them all. As a child, I would tell my parents daily that they were not my real parents and that my real parents died in a train accident. At first, they thought it was cute, but after a few months of this, they had to put a stop to my story. Out of the blue, my two-year-old daughter said, if you're quiet, you'll stay alive. I still have no clue where that came from. My daughter and her friend were talking about dinosaurs. I asked her if you were a T-Rex, what would you eat? She got very serious, looked me right in the eyes and said, children, I'd eat children. Last week, my five-year-old son asked me, what do you see through the black circles in my eyes when you're controlling me when I'm at school? My five-year-old son gave me a card he'd made at school. On the front, it said how you see yourself. He had drawn a picture of me walking in a meadow. I was surrounded by blue skies, a blazing sun, green grass, and butterflies. There was a big smile on my face. Inside, it said how you really are. There was a picture of me in a jail cell gripping the bars and crying. I work in a preschool. There is a small toy kitchen in our classroom that the kids use for playing how. There was one little girl who was playing with a baby doll, rocking it back and forth and singing to it. Suddenly, she shoved it into the toy oven, slammed the door shut, turned to me and said, sometimes bad babies go in timeout. My mother told me that when I was a little girl, I saw some guy at the grocery store and started screaming and crying. It was so bad we had to leave. And when we got back to the car, my mom asked what was wrong. I told her he took me away from my first mom and hid me under his floor and made me sleep for a long time until I woke up with my new mom. It totally freaked my mother out. My daughter told me that there's a woman in her bedroom who watches her and sleeps on the ceiling above her bed. She also says the woman doesn't like me and wants to eat my heart. A few days after my dad passed away, my mother and I were awoken in the middle of the night by a furious banging noise. We went downstairs to find my little sister desperately trying to open the back door, yelling. He wants back in, we have to let him back in. We had a small fire in the backyard and my baby cousin picked up a branch, lit it on fire and stared at it for a few minutes, muttering burn, burn. But eventually, as the whole stick caught fire, he started laughing maniacally and yelling in a deep demonic voice. But you run in G, Burunanengi, Burunan, Munyu must terrifying. My mother told me that when I was a child, I asked her what it was like to die. When she said she didn't know, I told her not to worry because I'd find out when I was 21. My aunt was very sick and my wife and I were talking about the cost of making arrangements. For the funeral, our four-year-old son walked in and said, why don't you just set her on fire? As it turned out, that's how he thought cremation worked. We were collecting my mother-in-law at the airport. While we were waiting, my husband picked up our son and joked about tossing him over the railing. On the way home in the car, our son spent the next three hours making a booklet 
titled All the Times My Dad Has Tried to Kill Me. There were illustrations showing him in all sorts of peril, including being flushed down the toilet by my husband. My mother-in-law was horrified. I was making dinner and my five-year-old niece casually walked through the kitchen and said, I'll get you and I'll make it look like a bloody accident. It scared the heck out of me, but later I found out she was quoting a line from the cat in the hat where I asked my three kids what they wanted to do when they grew up. My 10-year-old said, I want to be a teacher. My eight-year-old said, I want to be a writer. My six-year-old said, I want to run the machine that cuts the heads off chickens. I was giving my six-year-old daughter a bath and she a couple Barbies in the tub with her. One of the Barbies had no head, the head was floating in the water. I asked her to reattach the head because it was creepy. She responded, why mom, it's not real. If it was real, the bath would be full of blood and that would be creepy. One night I was reading my three-year-old niece a bedtime story and I fell asleep. When I woke up, it was dark and eerily silent. There was a nightlight on. I turned over and saw my niece. Her eyes were wide open and she was staring at me. Then she whispered, how did you get out of your box? You asked my nephew what he was drawing and he replied, a skeleton making machine. On further inspection, I saw that he hadn't drawn a skeleton making machine, but rather a flesh removal machine, complete with screaming naked men and a channel for the blood. Creepy. My wife and I were giving our daughter a bath one night when all of a sudden she said, you humans brought me here. It took us four months to figure out that it was a line she heard in a movie. Late one night, I was sitting at my friend's kitchen table when her daughter walked into the kitchen and said, Mommy, when I was older, I crashed the car and died. Can I have something to drink? My friend calmly gave her daughter a glass of milk and sent her off to bed. It gave me the chills, but my friend didn't want to talk about it. She started crying and told me never to bring it up again. When I was six years old, we moved house, I said my mother. The lady who used to live here told me that she hates the wallpaper and you are covering up her note. She just thought it was childish rambling and forgot all about it. 12 years later, my mother was redecorating the house. She took down the wallpaper in the attic and found a suicide note scratched into the wall. When my mother was pregnant, my little brother came into the room and pointed a Nerf gun at her stomach. Oh no, don't shoot me. My mom said playfully, don't worry mom. He replied, I'm not trying to kill you. I'm just trying to kill the baby. A friend of mine brought her three-year-old son over to my apartment. I asked him what his favorite holiday was. He replied, I like Halloween because I like candy and death. I was minding my own business, working in the garage when the door creaked open and my two-year-old son popped his head in and asked, Daddy, are you dead yet? I replied, no. And then he just slowly closed the door. I was at a friend's house when his four-year-old cousin was getting ready to go to bed. He walked around giving everyone a good night hug. I said to him, sweet dreams. He stopped at the top of the stairs, turned around and with a very serious face said, I'll control your dreams and make them nightmares. My son was four and his sister was almost two. I had to go to a meeting and I couldn't read them a bedtime story. I promised I would read them to the following night to make up for it. My son said, it's okay, mom, Monty, Tracy will read to us. I felt the hairs go up on the back of my neck. Who? I asked. And Auntie Tracy, mom, he said. Isla looks just like you. After we go to bed, she reads and sings to us. I had never told them that I was an identical twin and my sister died at birth. Her name was Tracy. My wife was making a sandwich for our four-year-old son. He was watching her really intently and she asked what he was doing. He replied, I'm watching you make a sandwich. So I know how to do it when you die. While I was cooking dinner one evening, my four-year-old daughter came in and wanted to help. You're not gonna touch the stove, are you? I asked. No, she replied. Do you know why you shouldn't touch the stove? I asked. She looked at me and in a very serious tone replied because I might get burned and die and then you'd have to eat me. I was blowing my nose into a tissue and my six-year-old daughter asked if she could see it. I said no and she responded with, I promise I won't eat it. White Lies is a short story about a young girl who can't tell the truth and her mother who can't stand liars. There was a young girl named Chiaki. She was playing in her bedroom when she heard her mother calling her from the kitchen. She raced downstairs. Chiaki, come here. I have something to ask you, her mother said. What is it? Asked Chiaki. Do you know who ate the cakes that were meant for the guests? Uh, no. I don't know, Chiaki replied. Did you eat the cakes? Her mother asked. No, mama, I didn't, the little girl replied. 
Shiaki was wringing her hands nervously. Shiaki, I know when you are lying, her mother said, a thief always starts out in life by lying. And the police always catch a thief. And the thief is always punished. Do you know what I'm saying, Shiaki? Shiaki couldn't bear the guilt anymore. She started sobbing. Mama, I'm sorry. She wailed. I ate the cakes. I'm sorry. There, there. Stop crying, said her mother as she held her hand. I was angry because you lied to me. Now you've told the truth, everything is going to be fine. I don't like liars, so never lie to me again. Okay, okay, said Shiaki. Now dry your tears, said her mother. We'll go to the store and buy more cakes. Okay, Mama, Shiaki says that's Shiaki's mother had a baby. When she came home from the hospital, Shiaki was delighted. This is Nana, her mother said. You're her big sister. You have to treat her with love and care. I will, Mama, Chiaki said, but after the baby arrived, her mother didn't seem to have any time for her. The baby cried all day and all night. Chiaki couldn't bear to hear it screaming and bawling. She couldn't concentrate, she couldn't even think. Eventually, she had enough. Mama, I'm sick and tired of hearing her cry. She shouted, I can't study with all this racket. Can you please shut her up? You need to be more understanding, her mother said. Nana is just a baby. You're her big sister. But you're always with Nana, Chiaki cried. You never have time for me anymore. I'd like to spend time with you too, Mamama. I'd like to go to the store with you, to the park with you, cuddle with you. You're old enough to go to all those places by yourself, her mother said, so shut your mouth and stop being so selfish. I hate you. Chiaki screamed as she burst into tears. And she ran upstairs, slammed her door, and locked herself in her room. That evening, she refused to come down for dinner. Instead, she stayed in her room and brooded about Nana. That night, Chiaki had a very disturbing dream. In the nightmare, she saw herself walking through the house in darkness. She went into her mother's room and tiptoed over to the baby's crib. Then, she picked up her little sister and carried her downstairs. I in the dream, Chiaki opened the back door and brought Nana out to the garden. There, by the light of the moon, she fetched a shovel from the shed, dug a little hole in the wet grass, and buried her little sister alive. When she woke up in the morning, Chiaki was shaking and covered in sweat. She felt sick to her stomach. The nightmare had seemed so real. She was horrified mom was right, she thought. Nana is just a baby. I'm her big sister. I need to learn to put up with things like this. I'm going to ask mom to forgive me. Just then, her mother burst into her room. Tears were streaming down her face. Chiaki, do you know where Nana is? She asked. When I woke up this morning, she wasn't in her crib. Do you know anything? The little girl shook her head. Are you sure? Her mother demanded, you really don't know anything. Do you swear? Chiaki gulped. Yes, I swear, she said weakly. All right, all right. Her mother said, help me find her. They searched the house from top to bottom, but they couldn't find Nana. They ran up and down the street looking for the baby but she was nowhere to be seen. Finally, her mother fell to her knees and began sobbing uncontrollably. Where did Nana go? She wailed. Where could she be? She doesn't even know how to walk. How could she disappear like this? Shiaki was wringing her hands nervously. Chiaki, you know something? Her mother screamed. Um, Chiaki, you know what happened to Nana, don't you? No, said Chiaki. I don't know anything. Chiaki, I warned you not to lie to me again. Her mother screamed. I'm not lying, Chiaki mumbled. I know when you're lying, her mother shouted. Tell me, where is she? Where is Nana? Chiaki couldn't bear the guilt anymore. She looked out the window and pointed at a little mound of earth in the garden. No, her mother cried. Dear God, no, this can't be true. Mama, the little girl sobbed. She tried to grab her mother's hand. Don't touch me. Her mother screamed. You killed Nana, didn't you? You killed her because you were jealous. I didn't mean it, Mama, Chiaki cried. I didn't mean it. Her mother flew into a violent rage and she grabbed her daughter by the neck and began choking the life out of her. She squeezed and squeezed until she couldn't squeeze anymore. By the time she came to her senses, Chiaki lay dead on the kitchen floor. Suddenly the doorbell rang. The mother got to her feet and answered it. When she opened the door, she saw her neighbor standing outside. He was holding Nana in his arms. We found her crawling around outside, he said. She must have gotten out of her crib during the night. Good thing we found her before something bad happened. Clap Clap is a scary story about a man and woman who get lost in the mountains and come across an old cabin. One day, a young married couple went hiking in the mountains. As the sun began to set, they realized that they were lost. The wife was getting worried, but her husband tried to calm her down and assured her that they would eventually find their way back to their car. However, after walking for hours, they still had no idea where they were. 
It was growing dark and the man and wife were getting desperate. They didn't have a map or a compass with them, and all the trees looked the same. Just when they were about to give up hope, they came across an old cabin in a clearing. The cabin looked as if it had seen better days. It was dilapidated and seemed like it hadn't been used in a long time. Some of the windows were cracked and broken, and a lot of the tiles had fallen off the roof. The husband knocked on the front door, but there was no response. When he turned the handle, it slowly creaked open. Inside, they found it was in a bad state of disrepair. There was very little furniture, and the floor was covered in a thick layer of dust. As the couple cautiously looked around, they noticed a strange atmosphere and a peculiar musty smell. The walls were covered from floor to ceiling with graffiti. Written in red paint, the words death. Death, 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 death. We were repeated over and over again. The man and woman were unnerved. With a shaking hand, the husband reached out to touch the wall. He was horrified to find that the paint was not yet dry. The couple were very frightened, but they had nowhere else to go. They knew that the mountain was dangerous at night and there were lots of wild animals prowling the woods. Despite the creepy writing on the walls, they decided to stay the night. Going upstairs, they found a moth-eaten mattress that was covered in stains. The husband and wife wrapped themselves in an old piece of carpet to keep warm and tried to make themselves as comfortable as possible under the circumstances. They lay down together on the mattress and eventually managed to fall asleep. Sometime after midnight, the couple were awakened by a strange rustling noise. It sounded like someone or something was moving around outside the shack. Did you hear that? Asked his wife. I think there's somebody out there. Her husband listened for a while, but he didn't hear anything. He got out of bed and walked over to the window. It was too dark outside to see anything. Opening the window, he stuck his head out. Who was there? He called nervously. There was no answer. He was about to go back to bed when his wife said, maybe it's someone who can't speak. The husband returned to the window and said, is there anybody out there? Clap once for yes and twice for no. He strained his ears to listen. The stars twinkled in the night sky. The crickets were chirping loudly. Abracting was no lesson. He heard a loud clap. The man turned to his wife and said, in surprise, you were right. There's someone out there. He leaned out the window and his eyes scanned the darkness. He couldn't make out anything in the pitch black. Are you the owner of this cabin? He asked, Clap! Clap! Are you a man? Clap. You're a woman then. Clap! Clap! Are you human? Clap! Clap! A chill ran down his spine. He swallowed hard and croaked. Did you come here alone? Clap! How many are with you? Clap once for each person. Clap! Click Clack Slide is a scary urban legend about the ghost of a woman whose legs were cut off in a fatal car accident. One day, a mother took her son and daughter shopping at the local mall. On their way home, they had to drive across the railroad tracks. While they were crossing the railroad tracks, the car got stuck in suddenly. They saw a train coming in the distance. The mother started freaking out and was still struggling to get off the tracks when the train plowed straight into her car. Police were searching through the wreckage and found the dead bodies of the two children. They also came across the severed legs of an adult woman, but the mother's top half was never found. Shortly afterwards, a series of horrible murders occurred in the small town. All of the victims were children. In the schoolyards, rumors began to spread among the kids about a monster they called Click Clack. They said it was the ghost of a woman who had no legs. According to the story, she had really long fingernails and used them to drag herself around. Her name came from the click clack sound her nails made as she was chasing you. The children warned each other to stay indoors after dark. According to the legend, click clack would stalk the streets after 6.00 p.m. looking for children to kill. When she caught them, she would tear them in half. Soon, every child in town knew the legend of click clack and made sure to lock all the doors and windows in their houses in the evening. One day, a girl was playing in the backyard when her mother came out and told her to go to the shop and buy three bottles of milk. The girl went on the errand and carefully planned to get back home before 6 p.m. because she had heard that was the time when Click Clack came out. When she reached the local shop, the girl discovered that they were out of milk. She had to go to several shops before she could find three bottles of milk to buy. On the way home, the girl looked at her watch. The time was 5.52 p.m. She looked around and saw parents hurriedly calling their children indoors and nervously locking their windows and front doors. She started running and had almost reached her street when she heard a strange noise. Click clack slide, click click drag, click clack slide. She turned around, but the street was empty. She increased her pace, but the strange noise seemed to follow her. Click clack drag, click click slide, click clack drag. She ran as fast as she could until she finally reached her house. 
She started pounding on the front door. The girl's mom had fallen asleep and the door was locked and the curtains were closed. All of a sudden, the pounding stopped. A few minutes later, the mother woke up and went to the front door. When she opened it, she looked down and screamed at the sight. Written in the doorstep in blood were the words, Mom, why didn't you open the door? The girl was never seen again. The Manhole is a creepy story from Japan about a girl who sees her classmate acing strangely on her way to school. One morning, a young Japanese girl named Miles walking to school. On the way, she happened to see another girl playing at the end of the street. For some strange reason, the girl was jumping up and down. May I knew that the girl must be attending the same school as her because they were both wearing the same school uniform. When Mai got closer, she saw that the girl was jumping up and down on a manhole cover. Mai was puzzled. She wondered what the girl was doing. Why was she jumping up and down on the same spot like that? Was she insane? Was it a game? As she was jumping, Maya heard the girl muttering to herself, 33333 three, 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 as Maya passed by. She recognized the girl, it was Haruka, a quiet and strange girl in her class who was often the target of bullying. Sometimes the other girls in the class would just ignore Haruka. At other times, they would play cruel pranks on her. The teachers knew she was being bullied, but they just turned a blind eye and didn't bother getting involved. Realizing that school was starting in a few minutes, Maya hurried off, leaving the strange girl to her odd game. That day in class, Mai noticed that there was an empty desk. Haruka hadn't shown up for school. All day, Mao. I wondered what the girl was up to. When the school bell rang, all the kids streamed out onto the street. Mai walked home and on the way, she came across Haruka again. The girl was still in the same spot she had been that morning. She was still jumping up and down. Mai walked up to the girl and stopped right in front of her. The girl just kept jumping as if Mai wasn't there. She had a big smile on her face and was saying 9999. 999, what are you doing? Asked my wife. Haruka didn't answer and just went on saying 99999. I asked you what you were doing. Shouted Mai. The girl just ignored her and kept jumping up and down. Mai didn't particularly like or dislike the girl. She remembered calling the girl some cruel names in the past and bullying her along with her other classmates. Who do you think you are? Mai shouted, answer me when I talk to you. Until that moment, Mai had never hated Haruka like the others did. But the sight of the girl enjoying herself so much and ignoring her so completely filled Mai with anger. You better tell me what you're doing or you'll be sorry, warned Mai. The girl just went on jumping happily, as if she hadn't even heard Mai's warning. Suddenly, Mai lost her temper and pushed Haruka to the ground. My turn, said Mai, as she took the girl's place and stood on the manhole. Mai jumped up in the air, and at that exact moment, Haruka reached out and removed the manhole cover. Mao fell straight down. The strange girl got to her feet and replaced the manhole cover. Then, with a big smile of satisfaction on her face, she started jumping up and down again. As she jumped, she said 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. The Red Death is a scary story about a prince who hides in his castle, while a terrible plague sweeps across the land. It is based on a classic short story by Edgar Allan Poe called The Mask of the Red Death. There was a prince named Prospero who lived in a huge castle in the mountains. His servants and courtiers attended to his every whim. The castle had high stone walls and was surrounded by a deep moat. At the entrance, there were, were giant iron gates and an enormous portcullis over the door. The prince heard rumors that there was a terrible plague sweeping across the land. They called it the Red Death. The disease was highly contagious and whole towns had been wiped out in a single night. Those who were infected suffered from sudden dizziness and sharp pains and their skin broke out in a red rash. Then within minutes, blood would start pouring from their eyes, their nose and their mouth until they collapsed, writhing around an unbearable pain and died. As the plague drew nearer, the prince invited a hundred of his friends to take refuge in his castle and keep him company. He locked the gates, barred the windows, and lowered the portcullis to keep everyone else out. Inside, the prince and his guests laughed and danced and made merry while outside the wall. The poor people suffered and died as the Red Death raged on. To keep his guests entertained, Prince Prospero decided to hold a masquerade ball. He ordered his servants to redecorate seven rooms, especially for the ball. The first room was painted blue from floor to ceiling. The second was pink, the third was green, the fourth was orange, the fifth was white, and the sixth was purple. The seventh room was completely black. The walls and ceiling were painted black. The carpet on the floor was black. The curtains that hung from the walls were made of black satin. All of the furniture was upholstered in black velvet. On one of the walls, there was a large black clock with a pendulum that swung slowly to and fro, making a loud and monotonous ticking sound. Every hour, the clock would strike, giving a series of loud clangs, like the tolling of a bell. 
None of the rooms had any lights. In each room, the only illumination came from a blazing fire in the fireplace that cast flickering shadows across all the walls. In the seventh room, the firelight cast such strange and frightening shadows on the walls that very few of the guests were brave enough to set foot inside it. The masquerade ball began in the blue room, and the guests were all having fun. Everyone was wearing a mask. The musicians played merry songs while the guests danced. They ate the food and drank the wine that had been laid out on the tables for them. Whenever the clock struck the hour, the musicians would stop playing, the guests would stop dancing, and everyone would stand and listen to the dull clanging chime. When the echo of the tolling bell had died away, the guests would move on to the next room, and the revelry would begin again. And as the night wore on, they moved from the blue room to the pink room, to the green room, to the orange room, to the white room, and to the purple room until they found themselves entering the black room. At midnight, the clock began to strike 12, and everyone stopped to listen. As the chime subsided, the guests became aware of a masked figure standing in the middle of the room. None of the guests had noticed him before. The stranger was tall and gaunt. He was dressed in a dark red cape and his face was covered by a red mask in the shape of a skull. When Prince Prospero caught sight of the figure standing among the guests, he shuddered with anger. Who are you? He demanded hoarsely, how dare you insult me by coming here without an invitation? Leave my castle this minute or I will have you killed. The masked figure made no move to leave. Instead, he stood there staring at the prince. Just then, an unearthly red light illuminated the black room and the guests became so frightened that they were shaking in their boots. Prince Propsero did not like to be disobeyed. He drew his sword and held it up. Leave now or I shall slay you myself, he shouted. The masked figure slowly walked towards the prince and all of the guests drew back. Too afraid to stop him, standing in front of Prince Prospero, the figure reached up with bony hands and took off his mask. The prince let out a sharp cry and dropped his sword. The guests screamed in horror. Behind the mask, there was no face at all, just an empty black void. All of a sudden, Prince Prospero grew dizzy and he felt sharp pains in his sides. His skin broke out into a red rash and blood started pouring from his eyes his nose and his mouth. His guests collapsed around him, writhing in agony and their screams echoed through the seven rooms. The Red Death had come like a thief in the night and one by one, the prince and his guests succumbed to the terrible disease. The clock stopped ticking, the fires went out in darkness and decay and the Red Death triumphed over all. The Antique Doll is a scary story about a young girl who receives a strange gift on her birthday. On the morning of her birthday, Lucy's mother woke her up and told her a package had arrived in the mail, and it was addressed to her. The girl hurriedly unwrapped the gift and was horrified at what she found inside. It was the most disgusting old doll she had ever seen. It was completely bald and its skin was cracked and caked in dirt. The worst thing of all was its teeth. They were long, pointy, sharp and beastly. They looked like an animal's fangs. With a shiver, she took the doll and threw it in a corner. Her mother scolded her, telling her that someone had gone to a lot of trouble to send her this antique doll. Her mother told her she had better appreciate it. Lucy tried to protest, but her mother would not listen. She forced the young girl to keep the doll. So to put her mind at rest, Lucy stuffed the antique doll into the little cupboard under the stairs behind a pile of shoes where she wouldn't have to look at the ugly, evil little thing. It was not until a few nights later when Lucy was lying in bed that she heard a noise, a shuffling sound, which went on for about five minutes. Then a brief dragging noise and finally a scuttling like light footsteps walking very fast. By now, Lucy was shaking in her bed with fear, unable to move. Then she thought she heard a faint raspy voice whispering quietly from downstairs. Lucy always slept with the door open and the landing light on as she was a little scared of the dark. She heard the voice say, Lucy, I'm on the first step and then loud scrabbling again as whatever was speaking apparently turned tail and returned to its place of hiding. Lucy was so scared that she didn't sleep a wink that night, but laid in fear until the break of dawn. When her mother got her up for school, Lucy tried to explain to her mother what had happened the night before, but was so tired that when her mother passed it off as just a dream, she began to believe it might be the case. Of course it wasn't. Lucy begged her parents to let her throw the antique doll in the garbage, but they insisted that it was a present and she had to keep it. So Lucy reluctantly went back to bed, telling herself that it had only been a dream. She checked the cupboard under the stairs, but the doll was exactly where Lucy had left her. That night, Lucy fought sleep, but she eventually drifted off even though she had fought sleep. Presently, the deep disembodied voice woke Lucy again. She wondered if she could only hear it in her head. Lucy, I'm on the fourth step, it said. Then came to scuffling noise and the voice didn't reoccur that night. Lucy was crying by now, and again, she didn't sleep that night. At school, Lucy told her friends about the doll, 
and of course they laughed at her. Lucy could only think that if the doll was climbing four steps at a time, then there was only one more night to go. That night, Lucy decided to shut her bedroom door. When her mother turned her light out, she asked why Lucy was no longer scared of the dark. Lucy replied that she was and could she leave her light on instead of a hall light. But her mother pointed out that her bedroom light was so bright it would keep her awake and said no. Therefore, Lucy agreed to just sleep without a light. She opened the bedroom curtains instead to light the room a little anyway. Just as she began to do, she heard the noise and then the voice came very clear this time. Lucy, I'm on the top step in the darkness of her bedroom. Lucy heard a click and trembled with fear. She wasn't sure, but she thought she could see her bedroom door opening very, very slowly. The next morning, Lucy's parents found her body at the bottom of the stairs. They guessed that she had been on her way to the toilet during the night and in the darkness had slipped and fallen down the stairs, breaking her neck. The antique doll was found beside her body and was buried with Lucy. Everyone said what a tragedy it was. She loved that doll, said her mother. Now they can be together forever. The Bouquet of Flowers is a horror story about a young woman who works in a call center and has an encounter with an angry customer. There was a woman named Mary who worked as a technical support specialist in a call center. It was very busy and the phones were ringing off the hook. She was having trouble keeping up with the huge number of calls. Shortly after lunch, Mary answered the phone and there was a very angry customer on the other end. He said he had been waiting on hold for almost 45 minutes. She apologized for keeping him waiting, but the man was very agitated and didn't want to listen to her excuses. When she was not able to find a solution to his problem immediately, he became even more upset. She put him on hold and when she came back, he became very hostile towards her. Mary asked him to remain calm and assured him that she would fix his problem as soon as possible. No matter what she said, it just seemed to make him more and more angry. He was shouting at her ranting and raving about how she was wasting his precious time and complaining about how much money the phone call was costing him. Eventually, the irate customer began cursing and swearing at her, and Mary was forced to hang up on him. An hour later, he called back. His attitude was even worse. He flew into a rage and demanded to know why she had hung up the phone. When he started using foul language again, Mary slammed down the receiver. At the end of the day, the man called back again. This time he had calmed down and seemed embarrassed. He apologized for his rude behavior and asked her name, telling her he wanted to send her something to make up for it. Oh, you don't need to do that, said Mary. No, no, I really want to, replied the man. Just a little present to show how sorry I am. We're not actually supposed to give out our name, she said warily. Just give me your first name then, he said. Well, okay, my name is Mary, she replied. Sure enough, when Mary arrived at work the next morning, there was a lavish bouquet of flowers sitting on her desk. There was a card with the flowers that had her name on it. Mary was delighted. Nobody had ever sent her flowers before. At the end of the day, when her shift ended, Mary said goodbye to her co-workers, picked up the bouquet of flowers, and walked out to the car park. She wanted to get the flowers home quickly so she could put them in a vase. As she was about to get into her car, she turned around and saw a small, balding, middle-aged man walking towards her. Yeah. Suddenly, he pulled out a gun and pointed it at her. Nobody hangs up on me. He shouted as he pulled the trigger. Mary was shot four times and died on the way to hospital. The police tracked down the man who shot her and arrested him. It turned out that he was the angry customer. He had sent the bouquet of flowers in order to identify her. 